morning. Blue death feigning beetles. Asbolus varicosus. How I start my day. Last time in part one of how to set up a pet desert beetle tank, we talked about the following things. Introduction, numerous clips of desert beetle species. We picked out a tank, cleaned it up, laid down some substrate layers, sand, compost, talked about some decorations. And in this video, as promised at the end of the last video, we're going to talk about plants and pesticides and so many other topics. So welcome to part two. One of the things we didn't cover in the last video was how often do you need to change the substrate? I don't think that you ever need to change the substrate. And particularly if you only have a few beetles, it may depend a little bit on the size of your tank and how many beetles are in it. You will over time, if you look very carefully and they blend into the sand rather well, be able to see their frass or their droppings but they're often the color of sand because sand is sort of multicolored anyway with different sized grains. You might want to get a spoon and do a little spot cleaning perhaps. Another thing that you could do is get a larger spoon or maybe even a shovel or a cup and maybe just kind of graze it over the top layer, scoop off that top layer of sand and frass and then if you want to maintain the same depth, just add another layer of sand. Likewise, you could simply just add another layer of sand if the way it looks is what matters to you over the top of your old substrate. The other thing that we're gonna talk about here today, what to feed them. I see a lot of people dropping in big sections of carrot and that's not a terrible idea. The beetles will come and nibble on it and it's less likely to dry out over the course of a couple days if you leave it intact as a whole carrot. Um, I have a couple other things here. I have some mushroom in the middle and I have noticed that my ironclad beetles, some species more so than others, particularly like the mushrooms. And then I have some squash over here, it's zucchini. Um, most any kind of squash seems to be eaten by most any kind of pet bug that is a vegetable eater. And so just a few things that don't dry out too quickly. Um, they will dry out more quickly because they're cut up into finer bits, but I highly recommend the finer bits like this. And the reason for that is because each individual beetle, rather than sort of trying to nibble a little bite or two off of a carrot, and you know, a whole carrot, will be able instead to carry off these little bits and eat it in uh, the privacy of their own space and not have to share it with another beetle potentially. Sometimes when you add a piece of food in, they will all come to it as a group and start to feed on it. And there's a possibility that they could nibble each other's antennae. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. I have always liked adding in these little bits of food. Um, they will eat them rather quickly and then there won't be any food left in the tank. And I don't tend to like the way a shriveled up carrot looks in the tank. So just a few things for you to consider. Also regarding the substrate, I like the density of sand. Rocks are okay too, you know, fine pebbles. The larger bits of sand in here are actually pebbles in some cases. Um, the beetles in a loose substrate like coconut fiber, they can have trouble flipping themselves over if the substrate is too loose. So now we're going to drop these little bits of food into the tank and we'll just watch the beetles going after them. Always fun. And these are the cichlid fish food pellets.
Very common thing that people will put in these tanks with their desert beetles are fake plants. And fake plants, along with real plants, look really nice. But let me grab a real plant here just for uh, demonstration purposes. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the concerns that I have with people using real plants. Blue death feigning beetles. They're called death feigning beetles because they play dead, some longer than others. So this one will work just fine. This is actually a cutting off of a Christmas cactus that my mom got the year I was born. I'm just going to set it in here uh, so that we can talk about it. Obviously, I'm not going to plant it in this tank. One of the most common health concerns that people write me with for desert beetles in general, is that they discover that their beetles are upside down on their backs, twitching. And some beetles will do that as part of their death feigning display. And why are they called death feigning beetles? That's why. One of the great things about these smooth ones, as bolus levis, is that they do these great little twitching behaviors when they're doing their death feigning. And they work as a great cleanup crew for roaches that die in other tanks. As you can see here, got a couple blue death feigning beetles in here that have minor imperfections. You can see that one has a partial antenna Kissy face. But it's also a sign of deteriorating health in some cases. Um, I discovered many years ago that a very popular store where you buy bulk amounts of groceries, they also have electronics and lots of other things, um, the grapes that I purchased at that place were apparently laden with pesticides. And I remember waking up in the morning on a couple occasions after having fed grapes to my darkling beetles. And when I came out of the bedroom in the morning, the entire house smelled like quinones or hydroquinones, these horrible uh, smelling chemicals, very pungent um, and chemical kind of smell. And uh, anybody who has had uh, darkling beetles may be familiar with this smell because they will secrete a little droplet of it at the tip of their abdomen if a predator comes along and tries to bother them. Well, when you've fed a tainted grape to 20 or more darkling beetles, it really, the smell fills your house up. And um, after figuring out over the course of a few different times that it was those grapes, I stopped eating those grapes myself because I didn't want to be putting those chemicals in my body. These are a couple different kinds of darkling beetles. This first one here is Eliotes trichostatus, and they have ribbed elytra. Pretty beetle, does really well in captivity. And this other species over here is Eliotes gorii, and they're kind of spidery looking, pretty good sized. Uh, this species here actually does really well in captivity, reproduces pretty easily. Great one for a pet. Another thing to mention while we're talking about produce that you purchase from the store. Even if you buy organic produce, which I do recommend for your pet bugs, if not for yourself, um, there's a lot of debate as to whether one is more healthy or not than the other anyway. The jury is still out on that. Just because something is organic, grown in, a, in an organic way, it doesn't mean that it's not 
completely covered with pesticides. It's just that the pesticides that they use are not synthetic man-made ones, but are instead organic ones, ones that occur in nature. But we all know that if you eat certain plants out in nature, even though it's organic and natural, you could die from eating certain things. There's lots of poisonous things that if you touch them or eat them, you're going to be very sorry very quickly. You just have to be really careful to wash everything as well as possible. And if it's something like an apple, which by the way is a top 10 pesticide food, I do recommend actually cutting the peel off of it and not feeding the outer portion, which may have been tainted with pesticides. Pesticide residues are a really scary thing. Um, before I moved into this house uh, about 15 months ago, they ended up spraying this ledge right over here. And a few months ago, I put an orchid mantis up there to take a picture in the window. And um, even though it had been over a year since that spot was treated with pesticides, the residues started attacking the nervous system of the mantis within 30 seconds, I think it was. And fortunately, I remembered what had occurred and it made sense to me rather immediately why the health of this mantis was deteriorating so quickly. I quickly took it downstairs and I sprayed it with a misting bottle really well. And then over the course of two days, it recovered all of its mobility. But to this day, if flies, if I tend to leave my windows open and things fly into the house and they go over into this particular windowsill and they touch it, they land on it for a few moments, those flies will die. So the point of me telling you all of this is that pesticides and pesticide residues can linger for a really, really long time. I have had many people over the years through back and forth conversations, we have determined that uh, their produce or their house uh, had been sprayed with pesticides at one time on the basis of the quick deterioration in the health of a couple beetles that were previously quite healthy and often for long periods of time. Um, sometimes also uh, somebody will set a new tank up and all of their desert beetles will start to um, show these signs of twitching and not being able to flip themselves back over and uh, it doesn't occur to them at first that, yes, we had our house sprayed for one kind of pest or another a year or maybe two years ago, and there's residues that were still in the tank because the entire house was fumigated, perhaps. So you have to take these pesticides, uh, these concerns, very seriously, and... Um, keep a close eye on your beetles if you're trying a new food. Over time, you will get comfortable through trying uh, and feeding the same things over and over again. Saw it cleaning its antennae there. It's hard to get those pesky antennae down. It's kind of like that spot on your back you're trying to wash, but you just can't quite reach. I wanted to mention this pesticide issue because um, all of the desert beetles tend to be really uh, long-lived, and there are very few things besides old age that will cause them to die. But pesticides, I would say, is probably the top thing. They're not likely to starve to death, they are often desert adapted, scarcity adapted. They can go long periods out there in the middle of nowhere and for seasons at a time where there isn't much to eat. And what they're doing in nature most of the time is bug season is like it's boom and bust. All of a sudden every bug in the desert comes out because the rains have come, the plants grow, 
flowers, seeds, vegetation, lots of bugs, lots of bugs been dying. All of these things are fare or food for our desert beetles. And so they all come out to feed. They might um, take some things back down into their burrows. They may raid the nests of rodents or something. Um, they will tend to live in the root structures of plants where maybe uh, some of the vegetation has fallen and it's down into the little nooks and crannies around the bushes. I find them under creosote bushes, for example, out in the deserts. Um, but they are not going to starve to death. And so one thing you just keep your eye out for is those pesticides and uh, any signs that your food might be tainted based entirely on the behavior of the beetles. There are certain places some pet stores have plants that uh, they have understandings with growers that these are going to be planted in pet tanks. They're being sold at a pet store. No pesticides tend to be used in those cases. Um, there are people who will keep plants for a long time and sort of let the pesticides cycle out of them uh, by repotting them in new soil. Remember, the pesticides can drip down into the soil too. Um, pesticides in some cases can be systemic. Uh, they can be within the plant itself, whether they've gone through the foliage through the plant being sprayed or they were sucked up in the root structure. So you have to worry about the topical ones, you have to worry about the systemic ones, you have to worry about everything around the root structure of the soil. Maybe if you've had a plant for a long time, um, the pesticides will have denatured, they have half, the pesticides decay in half-lives, I guess. And so conceivably after some amount of time, it might be different for different kinds of pesticides and different species of insects are more or less susceptible to them. So it's just really complicated and the easiest thing you can do is to just avoid putting plants in the tank. <laughs> so anyway, buyer beware. Um, I will say that there is nothing more beautiful than a planted tank for your desert beetles with plants and succulents. Um, some species may nibble on them, some may not. Uh, it just completely depends. And with that, um, let's look at some bugs. So I've got an assortment of desert beetles in this tank. Just popped them in here a few minutes ago. And I also added in some velvet ants because I always like the way they look in the tank and they are completely communal with the desert beetles. So we'll take a closer look at those velvet ants here in a few moments. Some of the beetles are still playing dead because I just put them in there. For example, this one blue death painting beetle at the back here. I wanted to mention the screened lid I put up here on the tank. Metal. Don't have to worry about putting a lamp up here on top of it. I definitely recommend a heat lamp up on top of the cage. First of all, I really like the way it looks. This is one of the few instances where I will recommend a heat lamp for a pet bug tank. And for desert beetles, it really does help to activate their normal day-night cycle. And if you're using this metal screened lid, you don't have to worry about fires or anything like that. Obviously, if you have young children, be careful. Teach them how to use this. Make sure they're turning it off. You can put them on a timer if you want to. Um, they'll automatically turn these lights on and off. I like these ones that have the flip switch right there. There's always a danger of a fire hazard. There's always a danger of drying out your pet bugs too much if you're using heat pads or heat lamps like this. But the desert beetles are a little bit less susceptible to drying out than most pet bugs. And I just really like to be able to see them crawling around. And it's very normal for them to be warm during the day and for things to cool off at night. But I like to leave the light on well into the evening hours because that's when these beetles tend to come out in nature and be more active. One thing we didn't do earlier was pour some water in on this side of the tank. Like I said before, different desert beetles will like it more or less dry. 
And so I would typically get water in a container of some kind and just pour it in to this side over here. Um, obviously, pour it down here a little bit closer to the surface of the substrate so you don't create, you know, a big lake in there. Just kind of gently pour it in over on this side near that log that we talked about. Not too much, I would say maybe three quarters of a cup over on this side. Um, every uh, four to five days, just kind of depends on whether you're using a heat lamp here or not, what time of year it is, the temperature in your house, um, what kind of lid you're running. Those factors will determine how quickly your tank dries out and how often you want to add water. Now the beetles are not likely to dry out at all. And one of the reasons for that is because I also recommend that you offer them some sort of juicy foods, like fruits or vegetables. The beetles are not terribly picky. You are welcome to experiment. Experimentation with foods is half the fun. Convenience is the key to success with many pet bugs. Whatever you're eating for dinner, cut a little bit extra up for them, drop it down in their food dish, and I also have these jelly cups here that we'll take a look at here in a second. Protein-based foods are also very important. I like to use cichlid fish food pellets. They're teeny tiny little pellets. Some people will actually use a water dish in a tank. And in fact, it seems that when people discover larvae in their tanks, they generally find them near the water dish. So that's a tip worth keeping in mind if reproducing either your desert beetles or your blue death feigning beetles is a goal for you. If you're keeping just blue death feigning beetles, one trick to knowing whether your tank has the proper humidity or not is to look at the colors of the beetles. If they are that sort of pale, powdery blue color, that is a good indicator that your tank is the correct humidity. If they're black in color or not quite a bright blue or pale blue color, that's an indicator that the tank might be too moist. And so that might be because you don't have a ventilated lid like this. Now, they can survive in more closed up containers, plastic containers with plastic lids. You might wanna punch some holes in those lids. If you do start to see that there are some eggs in there, which are small and white, Sometimes on the surface, sometimes under the surface. You may or may not see them. You may at some point discover larvae in your tank if you're keeping an eye down here. Sometimes they'll be right up against the glass or the plastic if your tank is plastic. So keep an eye out for them. Um, as they get large, and by large I mean over an inch, close to two inches, kind of depends on the species as to how large the larvae get before they're ready to pupate, which is that process of metamorphosis where they go from larva, which kind of looks like an orange mealworm, orange caterpillar, if you're not familiar with mealworms. These pie dish beetles, Embathion muricata, some of my very favorite beetles, pet beetles. They're kind of darkling beetle. Size reference there. See its head giving me a little kiss. And over here, looking for some larvae. There's one. Pretty good sized larva. Very mealworm-like. Bury that back up. That beetle will come back out. But the purpose of this video is to show you this pupa. That right there. Captive bred. Embathian. I might recommend that you pull them out of the cage and put them in their own individual containers. A large container like this is not necessary. If they're blue death feigning beetles, you're gonna to want to keep them at around 80 degrees, probably bury some wood in there with them, and then just cross your fingers because not too many people have reproduced that species. So I never bothered to entirely scrape off the mineral buildup here on the side of the tank. And I got a tip in part one of the video from, I think it was Lois King, who said that 
putting vinegar on for 15 minutes would remove some of those deposits. And uh, I've got this balsamic vinegar. I was too lazy to dig around looking for the white vinegar. Just gonna use this. I'm gonna put a little bit on there. I'm not gonna hold my hand here for 15 minutes, but we'll see what happens. See if it makes a little bit of an improvement. Well, I must say that I'm very impressed with how quickly this worked in removing those mineral deposits off the side of that tank. Just a little bit of vinegar. See this gap right in here. I just wiped it off and um, it didn't even take that long. Sometimes people will bury carrots or potatoes or other sort of less likely to mold vegetables, not fruits so much because they tend to be juicier. They'll bury them down in the substrate as food for the larvae or maybe push a piece of dog food down. And you might do that up against the glass of the tank there. So you can kind of keep an eye on that bit of food. You might see larvae feeding at it. Um, you might also be able to keep an eye on it as to whether it needs to be replaced if it starts to mold, for example. If you have a piece of food left in there and it's starting to grow mold on it, that mold could conceivably spread across through the substrate, through the lower layers of the tank. And that could be a problem for your larvae. Um, hard to say, there's a chance that some of the larvae from some species might actually like the mold, they might actually eat it. Um, kind of new territory for us here as pet bug keepers. As far as a temperature for your beetles, I guess I would say that 80 degrees is a good target. Another thing that can be a problem in the reproduction of your pet desert beetles, and this goes for whether you're keeping just one species in the tank or multiple species, probably a greater problem with multiple species. They will eat their own eggs. I'm gonna grab the camera now and we'll take a closer look at the activity going on in this container. All right, let's go into the tank. The darkling beetles here, you'll often see their abdomens up in the air when they are disturbed. And while they're moving about, that one just went right under the cork bark. And there are two over there in that corner. This one down here is Cryptoglossa muricata, what I call a rough death feigning beetle. They have little projections, little spines there lining the abdomen, kind of saw toothed, really. And over here we have a smooth death feigning beetle just kind of hanging out. We'll pop this one upside down so you can see their funny little antics, twitching like they're dying, like they're dead. Predators won't eat a spoiled or spoiling specimen. Another smaller one there. Over in the corner here, we have that Fleotes plicatus, ironclad beetle. And that's another one there, but that one isn't particularly active at the moment. Over here in this corner, we have a smaller Eliotes armata. You can see that it is armed. It has a spike there on the foreleg, as do these other large darklings. Very active beetles. This blue death feigning beetle is playing dead. You can just pop that one right upside down like that. And I put this one in here about 10 minutes ago, hoping that it would activate itself and it is not doing so. I just popped this dune scorpion down in here and it's right next to a blue death fading beetle. A lot of people keep these larger U.S. scorpions communally with blue death fading beetles. The carapace or the shell on the death fading beetles is so thick that the larger scorpions don't seem to be able to pierce them with their stingers. Now, I'm not gonna keep this in here for very long. I just wanted to demonstrate what the two animals look like next to each other and simply mention that it is something that is commonly done by keepers, keeping desert scorpions with 
their death feigning beetles. Now, that one over there on the right, that beetle, is a darkling genus Eliotes. And I have known a few people to tell me that the scorpions have dispatched a few of those beetles. And so I wouldn't recommend keeping the two of them together. I happen to know that this particular scorpion isn't hungry at the moment because it had a pet roach living with it in its cage that I had to remove because it was uneaten. What's going on down here? Smooth death feigning beetle getting a little friendly there with a blue death feigning beetle after jumping off this one over here just a few seconds prior. Those two species occur in the same habitats along with dune scorpions, Smeringerus mesaensis. Second largest scorpion species in the United States in terms of length. Desert Harries, of course, are considerably bulkier and a little bit longer than these. One thing that people do when they're building tanks for scorpions communal with desert beetles They'll often dig burrows in. They use excavator clay in many cases to create burrows that then dry and that will hold their shape, a special kind of clay. And in addition to the tank just being much more interesting when you have scorpions and desert beetles in it, which can be found under the same rocks and such in nature, the Beetles serve as a cleanup crew. They'll eat any bits that were left uneaten by the scorpions. And they'll even eat the droppings from the scorpion. And of course, this scorpion now has found this bit of cork bark. Let's see that dune scorpions, sometimes they're called sand scorpions. They do live in very, very dry habitats. And you can see kicking the sand out behind it as it excavates a better burrow for itself. They don't like to be out in the open, certainly. And I could leave this one in here. Pretty sure it wouldn't harm any of the beetles, but just as a long-term tank, I'm not going to do that. Velvet ants, very active. Velvet ants are among my very favorite of all pet bugs, just because of these high activity levels. They just zip around all the time. Now, of course, they do have a very powerful sting, and they are one of those things that probably would climb that silicone molding there in the corner. They also, some species to a greater degree than others, are capable of climbing smooth glass and plastic walls. So you want to be very careful because they do have a very powerful sting. They are not ants, they are wingless wasps. And my white one there, we're going to give him a gentle tap there, and they're not gonna go out of their way to sting you, but I want you to be able to see this gorgeous little grayish white specimen. Now, he doesn't have the crazy Albert Einstein hair like the thistle down velvet ants do, but um, I mean, that's just a koala bear of <laughs> the bug world right there, if you ask me little partial to koala bears. They were one of my favorite animals when I was a kid. Now these velvet ants are so active right now, just going crazy. I'm going to open up this jelly cup here and demonstrate for you how to use it. So this is a jelly cup. 
sell them on the website. I like them because unlike fruits and vegetables, they tend not to mold. Now, a lot of people will just set this in their cage in a place like this, and that's okay. The blue death veining beetles and other desert beetles will sometimes come in here and they'll get their antennae in it a little bit and their antennae, maybe their faces in the case of the uh, blue death veining beetles will darken a little bit for that reason. Maybe even get gummed up a little bit. I personally, most people don't have as many desert beetles as I do. This is a, just a display tank. <laughs> My master colonies are downstairs. I will spoon out just a little bit, put it in there, and then you still have all of this. You just pop this in a little plastic bag or a bit of Tupperware or whatever, uh, throw it in your refrigerator and it should be okay. You don't have to peel the lid off completely. You can leave it partially attached there. A lot of people ask me about how to use these jellies. And so I'm glad to have the opportunity here to finally um, document this on video. Now, even that's kind of a lot of jelly, but since I'm running a heat lamp up on top of the cage, it's kind of important because that will dry up a little bit. Another trick though, is that you can come around to it every, I don't know, 12 hours or so and spray it and that will help to hydrate it. You can actually um, spray in this little feeding dish right here as well and uh, a little bit of water in there. You could put pebbles in there too to help prevent drowning, but they'll come and drink at the edge of it. Uh, a thirsty beetle will drink, a thirsty velvet ant will drink. And this sort of liquid or gel, jelly, is also a source of both energy for them and hydration, as are fruits and vegetables. And don't forget the protein-based foods. Anything that you set on the substrate is likely to, a drip is starting to form right there at the base, is likely to sort of seep into the substrate a little bit and kind of get gummed up and sand will stick to it. I like to use these dishes right here, or I like to recommend them. And Another thing that just occurs to me is that if your substrate is too moist and not sort of sand-based, if it's mud-based, one thing that can happen is that the feet of your beetles can get gummed up. It can start to sort of form clods there on the little hooks. They're called tarsi there at the tips of their toes. And that could make moving a little bit difficult for them. So a dry substrate really is ideal for them. You can use pebbles or rocks if you want to. Um, you can see that that beetle there has just found the jelly that I left in the cage. And it's really going to town there. Someone requested today that she draw one of the beetles as a knight fighting off some sort of mythical creature. And so, they had ordered blue death painting beetles, and this is a blue death painting beetle here with a shield and a sword, and it's fighting a two-tailed scorpion. And sometimes in nature, two-tailed scorpions are born, and they, in some cases, can actually live uh, full normal lives and even reproduce. And so this is this is a real animal. However, it has a third eye, so it is also mythical. Um, but look at this knight, this brave knight here. He's playing dead. What do you think of all that? Brave knight? Yeah. So this is a pair of smooth death painting beetles. Aspolus levis. A mating pair. You can see the windshield wiper action of the male's antennae. And a certain portion of his body extruding, connecting to hers. A little closer on these windshield wipers up here. Mating desert beetles.
Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up, and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.